Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Donna Chow and I am your host and your moderator for today's class. Here at eLotus, we have been hosting educational courses for over two decades, and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CU content with over 200 speakers, 700 courses, and 3,000 hours of continued education. We recently implemented a new webinar sign-in process to make it easier for you to participate in the webinar and earn CEUs. You may have noticed that you no longer need to register your name and email address before entering the Zoom webinar room. We found a way to do it automatically for you so that the only thing that you need to focus on is learning something new in class. So today's webinar is Acupuncture for the Soul, Guardian and Support Act Archetypes presented by David Hartman. This is the last of seven course of a seven course series in which David has given a weekly webinar on the five element archetypes and five spirits acupuncture. To watch the complete series, you can now purchase all his past webinars on video and earn CEUs. Even better, I recommend the Gold Pass membership, which allows you see, to see them all for free, as well as receive unlimited CEUs and free herbs. So before we begin, I'd like to go over a few items to familiarize you with our webinars and how they work. Today's webinar will be from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time, and we will have one break. For lecture notes, you can download them directly from the Blue Course Access page in your eLotus account. To use the webinar chat room, set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing and be part of the conversation. To ask a speaker a question, enter your question into the Q&A box. If time allows, the speaker will respond to them. And finally, the quiz and the video replay. You will be notified by email tomorrow afternoon once they are both available. Our speaker today is David Hartman. He is a licensed Chinese medicine practitioner from Brisbane, Australia, who has been in practice since 1997. David is well known for his signature acupuncture point combinations on which he has also authored a textbook. David has given presentations at conferences and seminars all over the world. He is always researching and learning new things in the field of Chinese medicine and has a wealth of experience in the field. It is such an honor and privilege to have him here with us today. So without further ado, David, please go ahead, take over, and share your PowerPoint. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone. If you enjoyed today's class, we'd love if you could share your experience on social media to help promote both our speaker and eLotus. And as a reminder, the quiz and video replay will be available tomorrow afternoon, and you will be notified by email when they are both ready. On behalf of eLotus and our speaker, thank you again for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. We'll see you at our next webinar on May 5th, Intro to Environmental Causes of Infertility and EMF Sensitivity, TCM Treatments with Michelle Merrimore. Michelle has been incorporating functional medicine with TCM for 20 years, and this intro webinar serves as a preview to her weekend webinars on May 14 and 15, and we hope to see you guys there. Bye for now. It's Donna and Elotus, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, really excited about today. I am. Um, must admit, I was starting to get a little bit panicky. Um, the slides were only finished about eight hours ago. So um, primarily, that's as some of you know, I had um, a knee reconstruction um, late last week on Friday and uh, have been a little bit out of it with um, various um, drugs like Endone and whatnot, but um, had the last couple of days off of those in order to be able to concentrate a bit more. I also um, did a lot of this last week before the operation so because I knew that I would be running out of time. So don't um, be cranky at eLotus if your slides have arrived late. That's entirely my fault. As I said, literally eight hours ago, um, close to midnight, I had it finished here. So um, I'm really proud of them though. And going back through them, early this morning made me realize again just how much 
of this type of stuff we just don't have out there. And that's pleasing to me in, in the sense that I've been able to collate the information from dozens of different places and put it together for, for you today and for the last six work workshops preceding this. There's so many good books out there, and I guess like any book, you're always going to be short of words potentially in terms of what you're allowed to write about. And even the book that I just showed you before that Donna mentioned, you know, it's it's huge. There's over 150,000 words in it, but I was still restricted in terms of what I could put in it, in terms of word limit. So I guess for me, a workshop like this, this series was an opportunity for me to be able to maybe take what authors were hoping to do with their books in terms of the next phase or the next steps to add in the extra layers. And that's what I've done throughout all six. And that's what this seventh one is doing is it's adding those extra layers. It's taking your guardian or primary archetype, it's putting it with your secondary or support act archetype and giving it a name. And then we go through each of those. And as we go through, I'll get a sense of sort of the percentages of how many people think they are that particular archetype. We'll do a one more run through um, of the primary archetypes and we'll look at the, the the merged ones as well. So as I said, really excited about today. It's um, four hours instead of three. I was very conscious that the three hours just wasn't going to be enough time to, to get everything we needed done. And even then, uh, the five spirits component of all of our workshops has been um, honoured, but then moved into some workshops later in the year with eLotus as well, which I'll I'll talk about later with you as well. So, where am I? Let's get into it. So, as I said, seventh in the series was good of Donna to let us know that they're all up there now. Um, I hadn't sort of talked to Donna being a four hour workshop. I thought maybe we might have a couple of sneaky little breaks uh, time pending. One sort of in around about an hour and 15 minutes, and then one. Um, with about an hour and a half or so to go. Just quick ones to freshen up and charge into uh, the, the next bit. I'm conscious that the slides are quite uh, wordy and sometimes that can be a little bit draining on the eyes <laughs> looking at the, the slides. So just that chance to maybe just step outside, freshen up and, and get, back, get back into it to engage yourself. Okay, so as you would know by now, for those that have been here before, which I would say is most of you, I like doing little quotes about ourselves. This one says, always dream and shoot higher than you know you can do. Do not bother just to be better than your contemporaries or predecessors. Try to be better than yourself. Beautiful way to start the workshop. Try to be better than yourself. It's interesting because that's something that I've always pondered not just in terms of my own personal development and my families and people around me, but also just in terms of what I do in my life. So as an acupuncturist, try to be better than what I currently am as an acupuncturist. So the striving to be the best version of my acupuncture self in the same way that I try to be the best personal version of myself. And that prompts me always to to embrace the whole CEU, CPD point situation. And, and I always do so many more than I need to. In Australia, you have to do 20 hours a year. Uh, they're mixed up between various different uh, pieces of what those 20 hours represent. But essentially, I end up usually doing around about 200 rather than 20. Um, but anyway, it's my life and I like doing that. So that's the list of what we've done so far, as some of you would know. And this is what we're doing. So because you only just got the slides, you might not have had much of a chance to look through it. 
So um, it's made up of five parts. And as we work through, I'll, I'll dedicate each section, make sure we're on top of what's going to be in it. But we'll quickly look at the review of the five spirits and five element archetypes just one more time, just so you can fortify your own um, understanding of what archetype you think you are in terms of your guardian and support act. We'll do a little poll, check the numbers, percentages, then we'll go through the guardian or primary archetypes and daily life scenarios. This is always a lot of fun. And I say always a lot of fun. I've only ever actually done it twice before, but it's it's just so engaging in terms of putting these archetypes into real world situations. Then we'll look at the merged Guardian Support Act archetypes. And as we go through each one, I'll get you to tell me if you're that person or you think you're that person and we'll get a tally as well. And then look at the comparisons of say a fire wood combination versus a wood fire combination, the little differences between those and so on. So I can see that you're all putting in your chat where you're from. We've done that every week. Um, so thank you for doing that. As you know, I'm in Brisbane, Australia, and in really exciting news um, with the world now opening up again, I am actually coming over to Los Angeles and doing some live stuff with eLotus, which we'll talk about at the end of the workshop. So my question to you is, do you feel you have worked out what your guardian and support act archetypes are? Now, I don't need you to tell me what you are. I just need you to put in your chat whether you think you are. So it's a yes or a no, essentially, in the chat for me, please. Still working on it. Yep. <clears throat> yes, yes. Some no's. Yeah, I think so. That's fair. Yep. And maybe today, again, because it's embracing the, the merging of the two archetypes you're most likely to be, it might further um, get you understanding what that is. Yeah, not entirely clear on what order. Yeah. And some of you emailed me about the order of your five archetypes as well, and I thank you for that. I've been, as you know, a little bit slack with the emails. I just, as again, a lot of you know, I've just had three big things happen all really close to one another and that's made me very time poor. So for me, thank you for that, everyone. Again, as some of you probably are aware, my guardian archetype is fire and my support act is water. If it was the other way around... I would be more than happy to continue to do online workshops, whereas my preference is to be out in the world doing the live stuff, um, seeing the people in front of me. And, yeah, I get nervous for a little while, but I think that fortifies me, gets me ready for the challenge of, of spending time with you and hopefully exciting you about our beautiful medicine and what our medicine can do. And we'll go through this in more detail. So because my guardian is fire and my support is water, we put the primary or guardian first and the support second. So I would be fire, water. Um, coincidentally, in regards to um, Chinese astrology, I am a water ox. So born in 1973. So from that perspective, water is not my primary. I have tried to be very... Is it objective or subjective? I never get that right. About which archetype I am. Um, and there's just no way that water is my primary. There's too many things in it that I say no to. But there's more that I say yes to than the third, fourth and fifth ranked archetypes. As you know, through the uh, workshops, and if this is your first time, well, this is helpful for you to know that APC when you see that written, means acupuncture point combination. It's like a point prescription, a treatment construction, what points you would use or consider using. A number of textbooks, workshops, conferences, and Chinese medicine, medicine peers are responsible for the point combinations presented in this workshop. They're not all my designs. Uh, a lot of them are partially or even entirely in my two books. I showed you one. This is the other one. 
um, at the end of the workshop today, I'll just quickly discuss the differences between the two. And 30 years of clinical experience um, plays a part. I mean, I started treating patients officially in 1997, but the reality is I was actually treating patients back in 1993 in student clinic. So it's hard to believe, it's, my goodness, that it's almost 30 years uh, of my life. And I wouldn't want it any other way. It's just the best career to have. Understanding the condition from a Western perspective, it's like when you break down what a Western condition is and then you convert that across into what that would represent from a Chinese medicine perspective is sort of what I'm getting at there. I think for me doing that makes sense. And then when you look at the point combinations in the tables, you look at it and go, well, what would I do? What would I change? But I want you to just always feel compelled to challenge yourself. Why am I making those changes? Oh, I just don't like that point. Is that a good enough reason? Why don't you like that point? Is there a reason? If there is a reason, does the reason still stand? Maybe it was a reason that you made 20 odd years ago, but doesn't apply anymore. I'll give you a quick example. When I first... Um, graduated, uh, pericardium six, um, or Naiguan and heart seven Shenmen were two points that I found hurt a lot on me. So obviously we've got the heart seven, got the heart seven and then the pericardium six partially down the wrist between the two tenons. They hurt me a lot when I was a patient and I felt like I lacked confidence in regards to being able to put those points in effectively without taking that idea of it hurting me and inserting that into the treatment with my patient. And so I tended to avoid those two points for gee, probably a couple of years um, before I realised that I couldn't keep avoiding them because they were so good. You know, they're really probably top 10, top 20 points in the body heart seven would be in the top five for me personally. So it's about getting the confidence to do the points in a way where you don't hurt them. But that's where, for me, if I'd seen those points in a point combination back when I first graduated, I would have shuffled those points off and added in some more to avoid that <clears throat> dilemma that I was facing you know, basically after a couple of years, I needed to be smart about that and go, does this still apply? No, we'll then start using it. You can always use the heart shan and pericardium or shin bao, heart's embrace for regulating archetypes, spirits and emotions. So there are a lot throughout the workshops across all seven of these. And there is a dedicated section in case you did not see that particular workshop. I think it was the second one in the series, the shan fire workshop, there's more time spent on heart shen, what it means, how to treat, what the pericardium is, how it works, how you treat it. All right. Um, Neil Gaiman um, wrote Coraline, which is interesting. I've got three daughters. They're 18, 16 and 14. Two of them hated that movie and one of them loved it go figure. They've never read the book. But anyway, the quote here is not from Coraline, it's from um, the Graveyard book. Basically, it says, kiss a lover, dance a measure, find your name and buried treasure, face your life, its pain, its pleasure, leave no path untaken. And again, I think it fits perfectly with our whole archetype system. It probably sounds a fair bit like a wood archetype person, leave no path untaken, but the whole lot of it <clears throat> embraces all five of the archetypes. Kiss a lover, dance a measure, fire archetype, <clears throat> find your name and buried treasure, metal and water archetypes. It's like it's um, looking at all of them in regards to how you might use them collectively to um, enhance your life and to help you embrace your life. Beautiful. Now, 
again, just wanted to mention that the five spirits, as I said in the end, because there's so many slides, they've missed out on really large coverage. So I do have a few slides here just to remind you. Again, you can always go back and look through the old workshops, especially if you've got the Gold Pass um, or if you've already purchased them anyway. Just to give you that reminder, but what I'm also going to do is we're going to use them again in a fresh way with heaps of new additional content in two future eLotus workshops, which are in July and August, I think. But again, we'll look at that uh, at the end of the workshop, discuss what's going on there. Now, some of these slides are pretty important for your quiz. So don't forget that the five spirits have a close relationship with the five elements, the five archetypes, all of the emotions. They are linked to a series of points on the outer run of the bladder channel on the back. So the trunk, the back of the trunk, um, bladder 42, 44, 47, 49, and 52. That's not in the quiz, but just knowing that that outer bladder channel has those five spirit points on them. And of course, the kidney spirit gate. The kidney spirit gate are in every APC today. The outer run of the bladder channel have been um, sacrificed for favour of the back shoe points. So it's enhancing the archetype um, and to a lesser extent, the five spirit by stimulating the organ which houses the spirit. So if I say I'm going to treat bladder 18 for, because it treats liver, which is a wood-based organ, um, and it houses the hun, it's also part of the wood archetype. So collectively by treating bladder 18, we're treating the wood archetype, the hun, and the liver and gallbladder. So that's the process. We'll go into that in more detail as we go through each of the APCs. The five spirits are a collective of five different parts of our soul that are inherent in all of us. So again, they collectively, if this is the line of normal, they are the ones that move up and down all the time. You could have been tweaked on something that's just happened and one of them has surged into an excess and maybe another one's push down into a deficiency just to regulate everything out. They're constantly moving up and down. You'll have favourites. Your favourites might be in line with your primary archetype, but they might not. Either way, it's considered a positive and almost a negative that you've got your favourites because they charge into war for you when you need them to. So that's a positive but sometimes they charge ahead of others when the others would be better suited because it's your uh, automatic fallback position. When we do numerology archetypes later in the year with E-Lotus, it's the same thing. You have these arrows of which are referred to as strengths and weaknesses, but to think that it's always a strength is a mistake because if it's always there, when others should be charging in there instead, it, it's actually a weakness. And weaknesses themselves can become strengths. So that's the same with the five spirits. They really need to be evenly distributed. And when any one of them needs to take charge, it does above the others. So there's an even distribution between excess activation, deficiency, subtle settling down, we don't need you at the moment, and then it comes back into normality again. So they're all in there, whereas the five archetypes don't operate the same way. They're much more solidified structures um, that move much less dynamically, no less amazingly, but much less dynamically. So those are important slides for your quiz. There is a, a slide at the end which tells you what slides you should focus on for your quiz. So now moving on to the five element archetypes, we're going to spend about 15 minutes going back through the key characteristics to ensure we're all up to speed. Looks like there's 138 people currently in the room. So just make sure that we're all happy so that when we get to the polling, 
we are in a position where we can say which archetype we think we are or if we think we're mixed or we're still unsure. There's no right or wrong. And it should clarify what's your primary or guardian archetype and what's your support act. And again, these are also important for your quiz. Knowing what five element archetype your patient is means that you can more effectively communicate in their language. It almost feels like cheating in some way. Uh, it's not what it is, is it, it allows you the opportunity to communicate in a way that your patient recognises, which they then embrace, which creates a level of trust, which also creates a level of <clears throat> um, faith and belief that what you're doing is helping them. Because ultimately we want them to heal themselves and if they're on board, then they're much more likely to heal than someone that is still standoffish and who is this bloke Davo and do I really trust him and, and so on. If I can frame my language so that the patient goes, wow, David really gets me, then straight away you've got your patient um, locked in and much more likely to get good results from it. Now, do you have to just do that with your patients? Well, no, why? You should hopefully be archetyping yourself, but also your friends, families, enemies, whoever. Often the people that we don't get along with are directly because we have an opposing archetype. So we bark. We're like magnets that don't attach. They bounce off each other. And if you understand that more, people that you don't get along with, even if you don't necessarily start getting along with them, you'll at least understand the reasons for why that's happening. And that's um, incredibly, um, is it gratifying? It's not the right word. There's a lot that you can gain from that. Or well, people that you just can't understand. Who is this dude? I just don't get him or her. Uh, if you understand their archetype, suddenly you start to understand them. So again, as I said, not spending a lot of time on this because we have done this, but for those that are joining us for the first time and for those that want one more look at the archetypes quickly, we'll get some benefit from this. And it never hurts to consolidate your knowledge. Every single workshop that you do with me, my hope, and this is what I hope if I'm the, the attendee, I hope from this workshop you learn something new, you are reminded of something you've forgotten, that's always gold, and it consolidates your knowledge. Those are the three things that I hope you'll always get from any workshop I do in the same way I hope I get that as a participant in workshops that I attend. So the wood archetype, the organs are important for your quiz, remembering that, of course, liver and gallbladder are the wood archetype, yin and yang organs. Every archetype has a yin and yang organ pairing. Again, the labels that you're probably familiar with are adventurer, pioneer, founder, forerunner, these types of um, labels that we give a wood archetype which leads into what their characteristics are, which is that they're very creative, dynamic, expansive, full of vitality. They show an initiative, a solid clarity, judgment and foresight. I love these two words together, appropriately assertive. You might be wondering how that's possible. Um, it's, it's one of those interesting ones. They can be very assertive in a way where you aren't as put out as you might normally be because of the language, the way that it will make you feel like, well, okay, that was relevant and that was necessary at that point. So jumping in at the right time, being assertive where it was required, wood archetypes are very good at that. They do come across as being a bit hypocritical, but generally speaking, it's that they just want to better their personal best or better someone else's personal best. So they make a rule that applies to a current standard 
and then they improve on that so it becomes the new rule. Very flexible approach, adaptable to change, decisive, direct, committed. When they go at something, there really is no stopping them. It's like a train going at 100 mile an hour. It's just that's a wood archetype charging towards their goals. They desire purpose, which is why they set their goals and charge towards it when they're of the belief that they will succeed. Compelled to win, they, they are the archetype above all the others that want to win more than any other. They briefly weigh up risk versus reward. It's done very intelligently, but it's done faster than any other archetype, but no less um, They still really do use an incredible amount of intelligence and weighing up the pros and cons. They're just faster at it than other archetypes. It doesn't make them better at it. Everyone's different. Sometimes people need to take a while to get where they need to go and decide on something. And that doesn't make them any less valuable than the person that flies out of the gate and works it out as they're going. Confident yet prudent. Courageous, bold, brave, ambitious. You're getting a sense of why they're explorers, why they're adventurers. Fiercely independent. Really out of all of the archetypes, you kind of have two that want to be around others and have to be around others. That's fire and earth. Wood are very independent, but then they love being around others as well. So they're a bit of a mix. And then you've got the metal and water, which prefer to be on their own. So you've got the five of them divided up into two scenarios, independence and being around others. So there's that classic five feeding into two Chinese medicine idea. And they're balanced between their hun, their heavenly dreaming soul, and their po, action, doing, being soul. Fire archetype has four organs, two yin, two yang. Yin is heart and pericardium, and the yang are small intestine and san jiao, or triple energizer. They're often referred to as the magician, salesperson, wizard, shaman, entertainer. It took me a long time to understand how to come across as enthusiastic staring at a screen. Um, thanks to COVID, of course, that's the way our workshops have typically been the last, what are we now? How many years is that now? Two, three, 2020. And so, yeah, again, it, for me, it, I engage better with the people that I can see and I operate off the visual cues, the verbal and nonverbal body language, which is impossible to do when I'm staring at words on a, on a computer. So the fire archetypes got to be a little bit more clever with the way that they engage an audience through a, a screen. And the idea is that we're more excited, lively, enthusiastic. You've seen me flinging my arms around all the time. It's just something that I do when I'm live I, I, I wander around all the time. I don't stand behind a lectern. Uh, I don't like feeling like there's something between me and the audience. Uh, I like to have that space, that openness and that connection. Uh, fire archetypes can be very persuasive, making them very good salespeople. They're even better at selling something that they believe in, but they're still good at selling something even if they don't believe in it. They take pleasure in achieving their goals, very talented communicators, can be quite spontaneous, which um, can negatively impact on other archetypes that want more structure and focus and planning. Happy and hearty, emotionally balanced, usually, but can fly off the handle and be emotionally inconsistent. Much prefer the life's ups, not the downs. Always very optimistic, uh, compassionate, empathetic. Lots of fire and earth archetypes would be considered empaths. 
if you were to use that label. Saturate normal with phenomenal. Very alert, mentally clear, aware, self-oriented, etc. Very devoted, enchanting, charismatic, touchy-feely. Love being around other people. Um, often harmlessly flirt. Um, it's all good fun. It's it's a buzz. It's adrenaline. Um, makes them feel good. And they have a very strong shen. So typically good memory, consciousness, thinking, sleep, emotions. Again, when balanced. Earth archetype. Yin, organ, spleen, yang, organ, stomach. And saviour is kind of my favourite, I guess, term to describe an earth archetype. Negotiator, mediator, peacemaker, caregiver, caretaker. All these are really good labels for them as well. It gives you a good sense of what an earth archetype is, what their yearning uh, yearnings are, what they feel they must do in their life. Very sociable, sympathetic, considerate, attentive, um, loyal. Now, they have a very focused intent. So when they've decided that they're going to chat with you, then they become, you become their whole world. And it's not creepy or awkward. They know the appropriate distance to sit or stand from you so you don't feel smothered or that you're in their personal space, but you're not too far away from them that there's the connection is lost because they understand who you are. Earth archetypes are a little bit of all the other five, other four, sorry, and so they recognise who you are very quickly. Once they know who you are, they frame their language and then they work out, based on your archetype, what's the language and the appropriate distance to sit or stand from you um, in terms of how to communicate effectively with you. Very stable, poised, composed, nurturing, supportive, agreeable, um, self-aware and understand you as well. So through that, they can they'll make them very good um, counsellors because they can very effectively direct the conversation, not by telling you what you should do, but by questioning you in a supportive way for you to come to your own conclusions. And this uh, needs very good constructive thinking, really good intelligence. Their senses are completely on, so they just are paying attention to you and they're very aware of, of you and the little bubble you're in, but also the dynamics of what's happening around them as well, at least to some degree. Exceptional memory, quick learner. They remember things with minimal study. They are so good at remembering people's names, what they do for a living, their partner's names, their kids' names, their favourite hobby, all this stuff. That that's They're the best at that out of all the archetypes. And they're very good at living in the now by productively reflecting on past events, both the successes and the failures, and learning from them, and even immersing themselves a little bit into the future um, to get a sense of what's happening there. But the primary focus of their life is the present moment. So that's the earth archetype. Metal, yin organ lungs, yang organ large intestine, so they're like the alchemist, modifier, architect, experimenter, creator. I think creator is a really good word, but it kind of isn't perfect because metal archetypes create new things, but they also make existing things better. So creator doesn't fully um, give a sense of what um, the metal archetype is capable of. So they're able to discriminate, very good at staying level, moderate course, quite reserved. They're very good at grabbing and building and obtaining things that they need 
to create the new thing or make something better, but then they can throw that out to make space for their next project when they're healthy. When they're unhealthy, they never throw anything away. They can be intrepid and adventurous if they feel safe and adaptable to change if you give them enough time. They have very strong sensation using all of their senses, but also just in general sense, sensation, sensation on the skin, sensation with their their nerve endings and their nervous system, very good, strong awareness there. They love finding the beauty in things. They're very precise and methodical and very, very ethical people, almost to a fault. In good news, they are just as personally invested in their own um, desire to be the best they can be. Um, they then throw that onto the rest of humanity, which is both a strength and a weakness, I guess, depending on how you want to argue it. Um, and it can be a negative even just for themselves because they might have too high a standard that they're trying to set and they keep falling short. So they can be self-critical of that fact. Calm, stoic, patient, optimistic, neat and tidy, able to spot liars from a mile away, emotionally balanced. They are extremely emotionally balanced. They don't tend to get too emotional about much at all. Uh, even when you think that it would have been the appropriate response, they just are good at that level headed kind of um, standard. And they set high standards for themselves and subsequently the rest of humanity. So that's metal and then water, yin organ, kidneys, yang organ, urinary bladder. They're also known as the philosopher, truth seeker, thinker, intellectual, academic, theorist. I like philosophy or philosopher as, as a term. Um, I guess for me, being that the water archetype is my support act, philosophy has been a real rock for me in terms of uh, getting a sense of who I am and what the world is and how that um, connection sort of all ties together. So philosophy is um, philo Sophia, so love, wisdom. Um, and I think that that's beautiful because it really gives a sense of what that philosophy is doing for me. I love wisdom. I love understanding or trying to get a sense of what people have said before and, and inserting that into my own philosophical system. So in a sense, I learn from other philosophers to become a philosopher myself. So what is their characteristic, a water archetype? Very honest, incredible memory. Um, the earth archetype, uh, and we'll talk about this a bit later, and we've done it already throughout the workshops. The earth archetype uses uh, their senses to remember everything. The water archetype uses um, both the senses, but also this inherent knowledge about the world that what they call pre heaven intellect. They're also more introverted, being introverted they're happy with because they can quietly observe everything that's happening around them and allow that to filter in through their senses to remember. Whereas earth archetypes can be extroverted and or introverted based on the conversation. Either way, whatever they slip into, they're using their senses to, to remember everything as well. But anyway, they're very, very intelligent, as I said, water archetypes, very sensible, practical, utilitarian, um, strong willpower and determination, very tranquil, quite curious, 
um, contemplate stuff, which, which builds on that curiosity. They, they find something that's interesting for them. For me, it's often a, um, a quote that I might see um, up on a, on a screen in a, in a movie or on a TV show or someone says it and then I go, oh, what was that? And I rewind it, play it again, and then I might write it down or record it on my phone or something like that, and then I'll go, who said it, and learn more about it. And for me, that, that's where that curiosity builds and go, why do people say that thing or what does that mean? And away I go. And this is just my support act archetype. That's how powerful a support act can be in terms of um, the power it can create in your world. Water archetypes are very self-sufficient, durable, tough, particular. They get things done and they feel good after they've achieved something. They get like an adrenaline charge from it. Have a very good imagination and creativity. They persevere despite fear when they're healthy. When they're unhealthy, fear blocks stuff. So the fear is no longer a, an emotion that they bounce off effectively they become caught in it energetic very modest um tell the truth very cautious conservative careful articulate and well, well spoken when they need to be they just don't speak as often as other archetypes but that doesn't mean that they're not any less articulate well spoken intelligent sounding So that is the archetypes in a summary.